Hello everybody and welcome to module 15. Now we're getting into multiple regression. This is the last module of these workbooks. So much of what we have done has built up to this content. This content is going to expand very naturally on module 14, where module 14 was really a special case, I hate to say a simplified version of what we're going to be looking at here, where in module 14 we had a regression equation that had one independent variable that we used to predict or explain the variation in our dependent variable. And now we can allow for as many independent variables as we see fit. And so now I can say, well, I have reason to believe that all of these independent variables can be used to explain why. They're all correlated with why. So we can expand our model. And now you can see how module 14 was really just a simplified version of a module 15 type of regression. Generally, in my discussion, rather than having big, long equations like this, I'll limit my discussion to just two independent variables because that's really the smallest number of variables that I need in order to be in the sphere of multiple regression models. So the approach is going to be very similar. This is that regression model. When we take the expected value, we obtain our regression equation. And so you can see here the epsilon term has to have that mean value of zero so that when we take the expected value, it disappears. And then this, of course, is what we are going to be predicting or estimating, I should say. And so we obtain those parameter estimates, B0, B1, B2. Those describe the relationship between our chosen independent variables and that dependent variable. This estimated regression equation can be used for all of the same things. Remember those two reasons I talked about for doing regression analysis. One is for prediction. Here I input values of interest, x1 star, x2 star. I would have to have one value for each of my independent variables. So I have values for my independent variables. I can use that to then predict the corresponding value for the dependent variable. Also, reason number two for doing regression analyses is understanding the nature of the relationship. And so here I have those B1, B2 values. Those are the marginal effect. And we practiced in module 14, we practiced interpreting those estimated coefficients as that marginal effect. A one unit change in X1, how does that impact Y? A one unit change in X2, how does that impact Y? So very much the same usage as we talked about in module 14. Similarly, we'll be doing hypothesis testing on the individual parameter significance. So on each one of those coefficients, one at a time, those would be our t-tests, our test for individual parameter significance, and our F-test, which now is a little bit different. You might recall from Module 14 that the T-test and the F-test were absolutely redundant. They were exactly the same. The T-statistic was the square root of the F-statistic. The P-values were identical. Well, now that F-test, again, it's still called a test for the overall significance of the model. But now our model consists of multiple independent variables. And here I have beta 1 and beta 2 because that's all I have in my model. If I had 3, 4, 5, 6, 10, 20, 30, the F-test would include all of those coefficients. And the alternative, not all, are 0. So again, you can see a lot of what we've already covered in module 14 it, it all carries through. Now, to put this into maybe a, a different way of thinking about it, similar to what I did in my introduction for module 14, remember when we talked about how in any population of data, 
all of those observations, or I should say each of those observations, can be described as a deviation from some constant. Every observation in a population can be described as a deviation from a constant. And in that discussion, well, that constant was mu. So if we take the average of a population, let's say like this, right? Here's that population distribution with that population mean mu. Every observation within there can be described as either it's something greater than that mean or something less than that mean. And of course, we know the distribution of those observations can be described by that sigma, by that population standard deviation. And so that was what this epsilon term was, was the deviations from that mean. And so this term was normally distributed with a mean of zero and sigma standard deviation. Then we went through and we estimated that unknown population mean mu. We thought, well, if we take the expected value of that, well, that's just beta zero. And of course, the expected value, beta zero, well, that was mu again, right? That unknown population mean. We predicted that with y hat, and in this context, let me use all of the same notation, that would give us b zero, which in this simple sample from that one population, that's going to be y bar which in the notation that we used back in here, module nine or earlier, well, we would have talked about that in terms of X bar because that's the notation that we were using back then. We didn't have dependent variable, we just had X. So again, we've, we've looked at this, but now I can describe it using a somewhat different notation. And so this again is that single dimension where here's Y, Somewhere here is y bar. And here I have all of those observations normally distributed around that y bar. Then in module 14, we say, hey, I think we can do a little better. What if each of those observations can be described as some linear function of x1, that independent variable? Well, then we had the expected value that we then predicted. And so this was then taking that population of data, drawing a sample from it, but now I've got these two data points. I have a dependent variable and an independent variable. For each number, each data point in my dependent variable, I have a corresponding x value for the independent. So this then expanded into two dimensions. So if there's a positive relationship, maybe it looks something like this. I have this positive relationship. There's that x bar, that hasn't changed. Only now it's described as that linear relationship with x. And so we had talked then how I can use that to understand that marginal effect, right? It's a one unit change in x and how that impacts our dependent variable y. I can use this for prediction. If you give me some value of interest of that independent variable, I can use that now to predict some corresponding value for y. Okay, well, finally, into multiple regression, this hasn't changed. Now, I'm bringing in another piece of information. I'm going to move it down here just so I have more room. So now I have not only x1, but x2. Whoops. And this is now, of course, what we're going to estimate. We have that expected value. I gather my sample. 
and I have B0, B1, and B2. Well, now I'm taking the same data. Now I've got more information. Now I've got this additional piece of information, X2. So what is that going to look like? Well, now I'm in three-dimensional space. Here I have Y. Here I have X1. Here I have X2. Here I had some y-intercept b0, and I had some slope b1. Well, here too, I have some y-intercept b0, but now I have two slopes, b1 and b2. We call these now partial slopes. And so if I isolate x1, and I think, well, maybe that relationship, maybe it looks something like this. And so there's that slope b1. And then if I look at isolate just x2 and I look at what is that marginal effect of a change in x2 on y, well, maybe that looks something like this. Let me get that out of the way. Something like that. And so there's b2. And so now we can see how we're building on this the most basic of models where there we are estimating a point, right? We are estimating just that sample mean. Then we are estimating a line, a linear relationship between our two variables x and y. Now, if I can just complete this parallelogram, now I'm estimating this surface. Whoops. So you can see how we go from estimating a point in one-dimensional space, a line in two-dimensional space, and now we're estimating this surface, like a tabletop, like, like a sheet of paper in three-dimensional space. I have my slopes that tell me the marginal effect so I can understand the nature of the relationship between x and y. And of course, I can use this for the purpose of prediction. Give me some value of interest x1. Give me some value of interest x2. Here where those two come together. Now I have a set of coordinates, x1 star, x2 star. As opposed to here, all I had was that point, x star. Well, now I have this set of coordinates, and where those come together, I'm not sure where that's going to meet, maybe right around there. That gives me that predicted value y hat. I don't know if my dimensions, I'm not good at drawing in three-dimensional space. Yeah, hopefully you get the idea. This point is on that surface, that blue surface that we've just estimated, and it corresponds back to that y-axis for some predicted value of y. Just like this intersects with our line and comes back to that y-axis to provide some predicted value for y. Okay, so that hopefully gives us a good introduction as to what we're doing in terms of the expansion from a simple linear regression model to a multiple regression model. Much of what we're going to do here is the same in terms of interpreting these coefficients, performing the tests uh, on all of those estimated values. But when we have multiple independent variables, there are some other issues that come up our r squared becomes a little less valuable. And so we'll have something called an adjusted r squared. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. We also have the potential for a problem called multicollinearity. Multicollinearity is a problem that exists if I have two variables or more that are highly correlated with each other. In this regression model, we expect each of our, or we want, we hope, 
each of our independent variables to be correlated with y. If they're all correlated with y, then we would expect there to be some degree of correlation between them. That's okay. Too much correlation. If x1 and x2, or if we had more variables, x3, x4, x5, if they are highly correlated with each other, that presents a problem. And then we'll have to adjust our model to compensate for the existence of that multicollinearity. I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to it in the practice problems. For now, I think that's about it. Oh, one more thing. We'll also learn how to incorporate non-numerical data. So we'll look at how to incorporate categorical data, otherwise known as dummy variables. A binary variable that takes on a value of only a zero or a one. And that allows us to bring in categorical or non-numerical data into our models. So we'll talk more about that when we get to it in later exercises. For now, this is a good thorough introduction to multiple regression. I look forward to working on these problems with you. Thanks for watching, guys. Take care. Bye-bye.